You're listening to The Nell Daily Show Unscripted, which is life advice from some of the world's most fascinating people. Some of them you're going to know and some of them you won't. And that's intentional because whether or not you're an A-lister or just a dude off the street, everyone has a story and something important to share. And since I'm also a psychotherapist, I'm going to dish out some life advice too. Everyone is in recovery from something. And I know we could all use a bit of free treatment from time to time. I certainly know I could. Before I introduce my next guest, I need to go over just a few housekeeping items really quickly. We would love for you to do two things for us this week. If you could follow us on Facebook at Nell Given Daily, that's my fan page, and on Instagram at Nell Daily, that would be huge. The bigger the followings, the bigger the guests. That's just how it goes. And two, if you could review our show on iTunes, I would be forever grateful, and I'll do a huge shout out to any new reviews that come my way. I will put a link on my Instagram profile on how to do these simple, simple tasks for us. If you could all take three minutes of your day, it would mean the world to myself and my team. Okay, so this week I'm bringing you the one and only Nora McGinnery. She's the creator and host of the top-rated podcast, Terrible Thanks for Asking. She's a best-selling author. She's a widow. She's a mother. And she's just amazing. She's amazing. Nora writes and talks about the thing we call grief, but she does it in a way that makes us unafraid of it. She does it with humor and style and grace. I'll let her explain in her own words how she started writing about grief because she does it better than I ever could. So, okay, Nora, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me. So can you just tell the, view, the the few listeners who don't know who you are, because I feel like everybody knows who you are now, and I'm so excited because I feel like I was one of the first ones in on The Secret because I started listening last year to your podcast. Thank which is you. Terrible. Thanks for asking. I know. I came up. Day know, one. I, since like day one. We just, I found it. I was with a friend, and I remember just listening to it in the kitchen going, oh my God, she's on to something. So can you just tell the listeners a little bit about who you are and what you're up to? Yeah, my name is Nora McNerney. I am an author. My memoir is called It's Okay to Laugh, Crying is Cool Too, and it's about uh, my marriage to Aaron Permort, who died of brain cancer in 2014, and uh, our, our our marriage and, uh, and his death and all of the things um, in between, all the things that make up a love story and a life story. Um, Aaron died six weeks after my dad died of cancer, just general, all the cancers, I guess. And five days before my dad died, I'd miscarried uh, my second child, which was definitely going to be my last chance to have another child with Aaron. We had an almost two-year-old at the time, um, our son, Ralphie. So I am a person whose job it is now to talk about all of those uncomfortable things in life. I have a podcast called Terrible Thanks for Asking, and I talk to different people, just regular people, everyday people about the hard things that they've gone through or are going through, and um, our podcast is the opposite of small talk. Every day we ask people, like, how are you? How are you? How are you? How are you? We don't ever expect a real answer, and that's a shame. You know, it's a shame because we don't just say that to strangers at the grocery store. We say that to our friends and our family. And when we keep saying fine, we make a really lonely life for ourselves. So I don't want to hear fine. I want to hear what your life is really like. That is a very long description of a podcast or my life. But also I work from home like yourself. So I'm alone a lot. And so when I talk to a person, it's hard for me to stop. Right. (laughs) I love that. Okay. So what you're talking about there is really and, and I just went to a grief conference out in Santa Cruz. For those who follow me, they know this. I'm obsessed with a writer named Francis Weller who wrote a book called The Wild Edge of Sorrow, which I'm not sure if you've heard about yet, but it's incredible. It right now. It's amazing. He's amazing. And uh, you and I have something else in common, which is we're both English majors. And I cannot stress Francis's work enough. It's filled with poetry. It's beautifully written. He's definitely a linguist. He's a writer. And he is basically a grief therapist. And after doing this work for over a decade, one of the things that, and you're right, that we're not even taught as therapists, is 
really that we have to be in right relationship with our sorrow in order to live because grief and the, the bad things that happen to us happen all the time. We can't avoid them. And our culture is obsessed with amnesia and anesthesia. And so really what you're doing is you're taking a different point of view from all of that. And I think what your, your work does it, it, you know, another part of it is it really talks about human connection. Because what you're saying is when you ask somebody how they are, you really want to know how they are. You really want to connect to them. And, and that's a way that we thrive as people. Yeah, it's true. And I, thank you, by the way, those are all very nice yeah. to hear about myself. Um, yes, I agree. And I had thought uh, because I had never really seen grief, by the way. You know, I I had had a pretty blessed life. And, you know, my grandparents died, but they were old. And so it was sad, but it wasn't tragic. Um, and when my uncle died tragically, I was in seventh grade, and I saw my mother just crumble when he had his accident. I saw her fall apart when he died a week later, and I saw her cry at the funeral, and then everything went back to normal. And I know now, having gone through tragic loss, that my mother was not fine, but she sure did a good job of pretending to be. And I think that I really could have benefited from knowing a truer version of what she was going through. And, you know, certainly you don't want to uh, place undue burdens on your children Boundaries are a thing, but at the same time, I did not know what grief was and how it works and what it looks like and that it's okay, that we are supposed to be sad when sad things happen. Maybe not right away. It turns out I was in shock for a while, so I knew something sad had happened because everyone was sad, and I felt sad, but I couldn't really feel the magnitude of everything and that's your body also helping you survive. Um but then I thought, you know, well, I'm supposed to be okay now. You know, now I'm supposed to be, um, now I'm supposed to be the best widow that anyone has ever seen. You know, mm-hmm. now I'm mm-hmm. at, like, continue on, run this half marathon I signed up for, putting on lipstick every day, like, look good when I leave the house with my child. Leave the house with my child. Go to brunch. Uh, go to brunch with people I don't even like. Go to brunch mm-hmm. with people. <laughs> Just like give and give and give and give and give and mm-hmm. never be alone with myself or my sad thoughts. Mm-hmm. So it took me a year. I wasn't even, I, I didn't grieve for a year. I, I, I assumed I had. I was like, well, yeah, I felt, I've, I've felt sad from time to time. But that real deep, desolate grief came a year later, which is also when I met somebody, when I met my current husband. So it's been a fun courtship for him. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, so, <laughs> so it, because it was through his love. The opening up of your heart to him that triggered what that experience had been like before you lost Aaron. Yeah. And that feeling like, oh, what it means to love somebody is taking this risk that you could lose them, that, uh, you know, they could leave, they could die, uh, and, and really learning, feeling those feelings, feeling that fire start to burn for somebody else reminded me of what I was missing without Aaron and that I hadn't really taken any time to just sit and feel that. And my initial reaction was, oh, I have to protect this old fire. You know, I have to, they have to burn separately. And that's, that's not true. That's not true. Trying to do that was, um, not productive. I, I felt really defensive of my love for Aaron, of my relationship with Aaron, when really I've, I've grown to realize that Aaron is not this thing that I carry around with me. His death, his loss is not this, this heavy burden that I carry with me. It is this strong foundation for what it means to love and be loved. And I get to build on that. How long did it take you to to articulate and come up with that expression or that feeling of, of in some ways we would say in, in my field, resolving grief, although I don't really love that term. Yeah. But we have, you know, you've heard the, I've heard, heard the word unresolved grief. 
Yeah. Which um, I don't I don't really love the idea of it being resolved either because I don't really feel I feel like grief is a river and it moves constantly throughout our life and sometimes we're like in the middle of the river sometimes we're on the river bank but it I don't I don't believe in closure it doesn't work that way. No, the closure is such bullshit. I hate the bullshit. word. Bullshit. I know. Yes. It's so um, funny. I, I woke up this morning and I, I thought to myself, the first words I heard in my head were, hashtag stop the bullshit. <laughs> I don't know why. It's funny you said that word. It's great. Yeah, it's total bullshit. Yeah. I, I, uh, so it took me a year. Okay. And I've been with this yeah. man for a year and we have a one year old child. So what a, what a life. No, have we been together two years? We've been together two years. Okay. So So you got pregnant a year into the relationship? I don't remember. Time is yeah. very hard. So Aaron, Aaron had died. I met Matthew a year after Aaron's death. I got pregnant like five minutes later. Yeah. Uh, which means, have we been together just a year? No, because Aaron's been there for three years. So two years we've been together? Oh, because babies take... Nine, nine months to be oh born. Oh, my goodness. I just completely forgot <laughs> the gestation period. Oh, wow. Okay. Now it's all making sense. So it took at least a year, maybe longer. It, it, this is a recent uh, revelation, which is that I get to have this love from, from both of these men, and one doesn't cheapen the other. Like, they both burn brighter together. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting what you said, because about grief, Francis Weller says that it's the most solitary thing we should never do alone. And in many other cultures, they actually have rituals around grief that are much more significant than our quick, you know, wake, funeral, burial, take a week off from work and then get back to the grind. They actually have rituals that they sometimes hold rituals in some African communities every single month. Where as a community, you come together and you grieve this, your own personal sorrow, the sorrow in your family and the sorrows of the world to get it out of the body and to know that you're grieving in a community so you don't feel so isolated. But oh, we don't do that here. We don't. Oh, it's so pitiful. It's so pathetic. Our average bereavement leave when you lose a spouse is five days. Can you imagine? In some cultures, you're not expected to do anything for a year. And I always tell patients when they come in in the throes of grief or they have a friend or a family member who's in the throes of grief and they seem to me that they're being pretty hard on them. Like, why didn't they show up for brunch? And I'm trying to get them out of the house and they won't come out. And I'm like, dude, there is nothing that should be expected of that person for at least a year. Right. Expect nothing. Expect nothing. Thing. If they, I always say if they want to take off all their clothes and run down Fifth Avenue and sort of howl at the moon, they're kind of, they kind of have the right to do that. <laughs> Give them, I know, I'm like, play that widow card, girl. Play it. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Play it. Yes. Yes. So, that's, I'm going to, that's, that's so good. I, I, it's true. Like, we need to lower our expectations of people because I felt like I had to live up to everybody's expectations and I had to be as generous as with as generous with other people and their feelings as I perceived them to have been for me, as if it were like a, a transaction. And that was super damaging. I spent literally a year just bleeding myself dry. Because if people were so sweet to you, then you felt like you had to participate and be sweet back? Exactly. I see. So terrible thanks for asking is actually the truth, which was you just wanted to say almost to people like piss off. Oh but my you couldn't. goodness. I couldn't. And then I would get in these bizarre interpersonal situations where I was like, how did I find myself here? Like, how? How did I do this? Like, how did I end up having lunch with this person? I don't know. I just want to be at home with my child. Like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing all these things I don't want to do? And I tell everybody, I'm like, you don't have to do it. Whatever it is that you feel like you have to do, you do not have to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. How did you eventually, like, I'm sure you must have had some really bad days, but you had a kid. So, so did, did, what did you do on those bad days? Was there anything that you did when the grief finally hit you? Was it overwhelming after a year? Like, were, did you, did you feel like you were clinically depressed? Did you go into therapy? Yeah, going to therapy also took me a year to do that. I got on Zoloft, 
which was super helpful, saw a therapist, started like really understanding the connection between my feelings and my mind and my body. And that when I feel down is when I need to go move my body and get out of my head and really taking that seriously, trying to get enough sleep, um, really basic parts of caring for yourself were revelatory for me. But yeah, I, I have a, I have a, now I have four kids. We have a big blended family and, um, I thank God, Glenda. I hope Glenda listens to this. Susie, my daycare people, Susie and Glenda, they saved me. They saved me. These women would, oh man, I'm going to cry now, but like, That's okay. uh, you know, I didn't have to say anything. I didn't have to do anything. I could be an hour late picking up Ralph and they would be fine with it. Mm-hmm. Um, they would say to me, um, you know, oh, if you need like a night alone, like I'll stay, like I'll stay. Dylan, who is Ralph's Manny, I wanted Ralph to have like, you know, a, a constant um, male force in his life. Dylan was 24 years old when Aaron died and he has spent every single Thursday since then with Ralph, taking him out to McDonald's. It's a, it's a weekly treat, which might seem too much to people, but no, um, please. It's, this and, is a judge free zone, girl. Judge free. Yeah, well, when I was pregnant, I was like, my child shall never eat McDonald's or play yeah. any plastic. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, they go, they play Legos together. They just have like their time together. Um, I, I'm really, really lucky. I'm really lucky to have that and, uh, to not, to have those people sort of anticipate those needs for me when I could not have done that, um, on my own. And children are so perceptive and Ralph is so tender and he would look at me some days and I would think, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. And he would look at me and hold my face in his little hands and say, are you sad today? And Are what you? would your response be to that? Because I, even as a therapist, I struggle with my own kids between letting them see my pain and grief, but also letting them know that mommy is strong enough to be able to handle whatever's coming at her. Yeah. Um, I would say I am. I am sad. I'm sad about Papa. And he'd say, I'm sad about Papa. And mm-hmm. we would just, maybe we'd watch some videos together. We would look at pictures together. And I wouldn't do my weeping in front of Ralph. Um, but I would let him know that I was having feelings. And I think that, you know, I, I just think that I do think that's important for kids to see and understand. And, you know, I have, I have a niece and nephew who are older. They were, you know, I say older, they were like six and eight when Aaron died, but, um, you know, old enough to understand way more than Ralph did. And they've been affected by, Aaron's death too. And so I think it's good for them to know that they come over to my house and there are pictures of Aaron and there are pictures of my family as it currently is. And we will still repeat Aaron's funny stories. And Matthew, my husband now, like he could tell you Aaron's favorite color. He could tell you where Aaron worked in high school. Like Aaron's a part of our family in a really in the way that he, uh, that makes sense. He would laugh like at that and be like, yep, I'm just here with my wife's husband. <laughs> Like mm-hmm. hanging out. But, mm-hmm. but I think it's I think it's important for the kids to know that. And now I have, you know, a bonus daughter who's eleven, bonus son who's sixteen. Like they know that I've been through something and they know that I got through it. And they mm-hmm. also know that it's not as if you muscle through something and you box it up and there's closure and you never think about it again. No, of course not. Like these things become a part of you. And so I think that if if I can express these things to them and around them in um in a way that is 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 helpful to them that's that's great because I didn't get to see any of this so I didn't know what to look for when it happened to me and I I I just thought I had to rush through it Mhm How how when did the I mean you oh, you were a writer before this all happened and when did the did the writing save you through the process I mean some people say that they're as writers they journal all the time and we know from psychological studies that journaling can be a massive propellant to healing. It's it's much of what I do in terms of my grief work when I work with patients and groups. And it's what I've been trained to do is help them to write. Because actually telling your story, they've done studies where it's not as – you don't come to the same sort of insights just telling it. And I'm saying this as a psychotherapist, which is obviously talk therapy. You actually come to – more insights 
I guess you could say, writing. And for some reason, I don't really understand the science behind it, but was writing always crucial to you? And were you writing through this time? So I was always like a writer, even when I was like a little girl, you know, my, my parents gave me tons and tons of journals. I was always documenting, documenting everything about my life. And, um, I did not consider what I was doing, um, during Erin Sickness journaling. I, I kept a, a blog on Tumblr and I did, I've always kept, I, I think also because now journaling is like a thing with a capital T, you know, like there's mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. Part, like people are like, how do you journal? I'm like, oh my God, are there concepts around it? I had no idea. How do I journal? I have a bunch of notebooks and I write sentences in them. Am I doing it right? I'm like truly asking you that question. How do I journal? So, mm-hmm. um, so yes. And I will look back at some of those notebooks and it's never one notebook. It's like 50 notebooks all over my house and be like, who wrote this? Wow. I was thinking that. I was feeling mm-hmm. it's so powerful. It's so powerful. Yes, write it all down. And then when did the book and the podcast come about? Did it come did it come from the blog? Uh yeah. Uh Aaron and I actually wrote his obituary together and mm-hmm. that went viral. Mm-hmm. And um through that my now uh my now literary agent and I pitched a book and I wrote that book within six months after Aaron dying before the book came out. I had, you know, I listened to tons of podcasts. I was getting so many emails and I still do from people who are like, Oh my gosh, I read your blog or I heard about this and I need to tell you, you know, not necessarily about their dead husband or, you know, brain cancer, but like they have a terrible thing they're going through that they want to talk about. And they're reaching out to a stranger on the internet because the people around them have just stopped asking or they never asked because they thought mm-hmm. it was like rude or they would make the person sad. And I just thought I need to have a place for other people to talk about the hard things in life, not just death. Cause I think once someone dies, you get a pass for those five days of bereavement. And then you need to be able to talk about like going through a divorce. You need to be able to talk mm-hmm. about, you know, the shame of bankruptcy or losing your job or all of these different ways that we suffer and mm-hmm. do it alone because mm-hmm. and we don't have, we don't have rituals around, um, around anything, which is it's, shame. it's so interesting. Yeah. It's so interesting. You say that we just did an episode on financial shame because I think people talk about five things, fear, sex, love, money, and God. And mm. yeah. And, um, we just did one on financial shame and, I I literally said I should have just called the podcast "fuck shame." <laughs> <laughs> That's good. No, yeah, because I'm it's, but but it's underneath all of that shame is the lack of self compassion that we have for ourselves, and again, it's the it's the feeling of massive isolation, and and what it does to the body and your health psychologically, emotionally, physically, spiritually is so painful and so debilitating. And I have to say, especially if you're a parent, yeah. right? Because because you're suffering and it's really taking a toll on your health and you feel like there's no place to turn. And so you want it to be, you want it to actually be a platform for other people to come together in this way to talk about the hard shit. Yeah. And to be able to create something that people could listen to and be like, oh, okay, well, I haven't thought about it that way. And then... Also, for people to, you know, who are going through these things to, to, you know, point to and say, oh, it feels like this. It feels like this. I might not get a chance to go on a podcast and talk about this, but it feels a lot like this. Um, and I think there's a lot of power in that. I, I have to, in the car, I'm going to be downloading your, your, uh, your money one or your bankruptcy one because that's, or financial shame. What is that? You can tell me later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just, it's actually, I can tell, I can tell you now it was this, it just, um, a really beautiful podcaster named Larry Hagner, who's become a good friend of mine. He runs something called The Good Dad Project. And I did a show for him on sex and intimacy. And it was it ended up becoming the number two downloaded show that he had. I don't know if it still is, but this was about eight months ago. And he had never had a woman on the show. And, of course, like we started chatting. And the next thing, it got to talking about sex and intimacy and relationships and connection. Really, connection is what I talk about the most. And this other show, I said to him one day, what's the show that beat me? And he said, it's this guy named Vincent who wrote this little book about how to get out of debt. And I thought, my gosh, yeah, there's so much financial shame out there. So and guilty so habit. much. 
it's awful. It's awful. And people don't talk about it. And, you know, um, the, the other thing that I wanted to ask you is, do you wake up now in shock that your life has changed so radically? Because as you're just dealing with the grief, you're young, you're a young woman. And again, you started this, uh, hot widows club. Yep. Hot young widows club. Oh, I can't hear you. Can you, sorry, can you hear me there? I just uh, lost yes. you for a quick oh, yeah. Can you um, it? Yeah, so so you started the Hot Widows Club, and but I can imagine here you're going through this time. The world doesn't stop. You have little kids, which just makes every day go by so quickly. You're lucky if you you know have time to pee and you know eat anything. And and here you meet a new love. You get pregnant. Do you wake up now a couple years later? You published a book. You did the podcast. Are you like holy shit? Oh yeah, and I'll lay down in at, in bed at night and say holy shit, or I will, you know, um, I'll tuck Ralph in and we'll say our prayers, and I will, you know, we'll we'll talk about Papa, we'll talk about Grumpy, which is my dad's name, and or my dad's grandpa name, not his real name, <laughs> and um, and we'll talk about you know our family, and I will think like I could not have imagined this, and I'll say that to the big kids too, you know, because our family is made from broken things. And I will say to them, I did not think I could get this lucky, and I know that I am not what you asked for, but I'm here for you, and I hope that uh, that this that you see how beautiful this family is for what it is. Um, so yeah, every day I have a holy shit moment. I think every day, um, if you cannot think of one single thing that makes you go, holy shit, wow, I am lucky. I am lucky that I just get to wake up and have a functional healthy body and that I have people who love me and I have a place to sleep. Like when I am feeling um, like really like those sort of like tendrils of depression starting to sneak in more, like I truly try to be grateful for the smallest things. Like, oh my gosh, I have a car. I have a baby. I have a baby who thinks I'm pretty, even though he looks up at me as if the forward facing camera is on when you're holding your phone. That's the yeah. as of me all the time. It's just up my nostrils and he thinks I'm the greatest thing in the world. Um, like so I, awesome. I got to fall in love twice. Like some people don't get to fall in love even once and I got to fall in butt crazy love twice. So all these things that seem that we just become sort of um, inoculated to are actually just crazy wonderful. <laughs> And do you, when you say that you start to sometimes feel depression, I talk to, you know, in the, in the podcasting world, there's so many podcasts out there that are about like, live your best life. And I, I just can't, I, I, it's so awful. I'm going to admit this out loud, but I just can't drink the Kool-Aid and I should, right. And, and people always want to plug me into that hole all the time because of what I do for a living. And I just can't be that. I, it's funny because I find myself incredibly optimistic and people describe me as positive. But I, I, again, like I just can't bullshit about it. And one of the things is I always say to other podcasters who are really good at sort of pumping people up that way and sort of like, God love them, like a Tony Robbins way. I have a hard time getting out of bed in the morning, no matter how grateful I really am. Like it's not easy. And I think what you said there is that sometimes because you're human, your your podcast and your stuff is talking about human, the human condition, our humanness, and that speaks to the truth. And when you say that sometimes you feel depressed or you get a little depressed, you feel it sneaking in. What causes that, and how do you shift out of it? Um, I mean, I, I know it's never really one thing, I, but like I, as I, of late, I I think that. Um, it is like excessive focus on um, uh, less on what I can do, like, you know, for myself or like what I can actually have like control over, which is just me, by the way. And then like um, it's misalignment between my expectations, which are you know, largely inarticulated to the people around me. You know, nobody, <laughs> nobody driving here, by the way, from Minneapolis to St. Paul, uh, knew that I had to get here for this interview at this specific time. You know, so I, I'm agitated for what reason? That like other people are driving on the same highway as me at the same time. 
Right, right. Um, when I am like that, I know like, oh, Nora, you are not in the right place. Like, you are mm-hmm. not in the right place. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, like, that is when I know, like, okay, have I, um, like, I'm focused too much on the shortcomings of other people mm-hmm. um, and the way that they've somehow disappointed me or wronged me. Like, this is mm-hmm. this is the source of, like, I would say almost all of my anxieties and, and, and darknesses and less on just um, what I have and what I can do and what I am doing. Like, I'm taking my eyes off my own paper. Like, put your head back down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And do you, do you ever say to yourself also that some of this, and I'm now you've interviewed quite a few people, and um, what, if, what have they said in terms of their sadness, how they shifted out of it or how they cope day to day? Have you learned anything from them? Um... Like doing this is, I mean, I'm, I'm sure this work has become so meaningful to you in ways that you never imagined that I sort of take for granted because I'm in, I'm, I'm communing with people's souls actually in a, in a private practice for the last 10 years. Yeah. So I think about you, I think like, God, this has been such an experience for her. Yeah. I think that I do, you know, I don't know if I've learned like specific practices, but I feel like I come out of every interview and out of writing every episode and just think, oh, like we're all pretty amazing people. Like, yeah. I definitely. Yes. I hate the word. Like I hate when people are like, you need some perspective. I think it's like the most condescending thing you can say to people. Mm-hmm. Um, they're upset or when they're like, you know, sharing an opinion on something, and you disagree with them. Like you need to get some perspective, but it's like, um, because perspective means so many things. They have a perspective. Like, <laughs> you don't like mm-hmm. it. Like, they have a perspective. They're seeing it from some angle. Um, so I think if anything, it's just really affirming, um, of the fact that, like, we all go through things and that we all have this, uh, crazy amount of untapped strength inside of us that we don't have to access or we can't access until we, like, truly have to. Mm, mm hmm. That's wonderful. Can I ask one last question? What do you see for yourself for the future in terms oh. of, of the podcast and your work? What What is on the horizon for you? Um, this is the work that I love to do, so I hope I get to do this forever. <laughs> uh, and I'm working on two more nonfiction books that will be due in the spring. So I'm just going to keep writing about these things and talking about these things and making things that uh, mean something to me and something to other people. Can you give us a hint about what the books are about? Um, the, well, they don't, they're like kind of untitled right now. So, uh, But one is, uh, you know, through my uh, current editor and publisher, HarperCollins, and it's a, uh, it's, it's a follow-up to um, my first book. Um, and I, I guess like the working title right now is Chapter 2. Awesome. Um, and which people love to say after mm-hmm. um survived anything. Um like, oh, this is your chapter two. So it's kind mm-hmm. of um uh blah, blah, blah. I'm doing great. And the other one is more of a practical guide to uh for people who are going through something hard or who are trying to help some someone through something difficult. Something hard, yeah. And it I wanna end with this. Uh that those are amazing and that's great for us because we get to a little bit more of a window into your life and your insights and, and what you've learned. But in terms of the practical side of helping someone who's going through something, I was at this conference with Francis Weller in Santa Cruz and a woman in the group said, you know what I really hate? I hate when people, when I'm crying, hand me tissues. <laughs> and I, I've, I've handed tissues over my desk in my office a thousand times, more than a thousand times. And I thought to myself, oh, shit, right? And she said, it makes me stop crying. Oh, yeah. And I thought, you're right. Right? Like, genuinely, if someone hands you tissue, it's sort of, it's, in some ways, it can be interpreted as like, okay, well, clean yourself up. Where she says, sometimes I just want to do that ugly cry, and I don't want to stop, and I know where the tissues are in the room, and I'll get them if I need them. I just want to wipe leave personally. I I will never, I know. And I thought I will never, ever, (laughs) I will like have them there, right? So people can see them, but I will never hand tissues, someone tissues again, because I always think about myself. I blow my nose and then I stop crying. Yeah. Wow. That is brilliant. 
I know. I know. Like, we need to write a book saying, like, don't hand the fucking tissues over. <laughs> tissues. Ugh. Anyway, Nora, thank you so much for being on Unscript today. It was such a joy having you. I really appreciate you. your time. You're going to make it in time for a bus pickup. So go, I go. I am. Yeah, you go. I hope your baby's better. <laughs> thank you. All right, cool. Have a good uh, one. You too. Before you go, come find me on LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn in part because nobody writes me creepy messages on LinkedIn. I'll friend you back there. I want to thank Teachable HQ where I film and record these podcasts right in the heart of New York City. They are an amazing educational technology company. And if you've ever wanted to create or sell an online course, you must check them out. They are your people. I'm telling you, I swear there's nobody else in the space that can even compare to what they're doing. I also want to thank my team, especially Walter and Corey for making this all happen. And if you have any suggestions for show topics or a guest, or you just think, I don't know, you have some thoughts on the show, let us know. We love your feedback. Send us an email at hello at the daily.com. That's hello at T H E D A L Y.com. Until next time. Thanks guys for tuning in. Peace out.